Hello Soundies. Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today's the 25th of July 2021 and happy to have you here today. Hope everyone's doing well and uh, got a chance to do some sound related things this week. So let's go ahead and jump into our session today. We'll take a look at our agenda and see what we've got on the schedule for today. First up we're going to uh, take a look at a new product called the Sentrance Portcaster. This is especially designed for podcasters, but it can also be used for live streaming. And I just want to give you a demo of that. This is something that I, I actually purchased this. Um, and it's basically a two input preamplifier recorder, um, but it takes a different approach than other things like say, for example, a Sound Devices Mix Pre or a, a Zoom F or H series recorder. So we'll take a closer look at that. Then we will also look at the Rode Thread Adapter and then we'll come back to our question and answer. So we have the uh, <laughs> we have the port caster up on the screen here. Let me go ahead and switch over. I'm going to mute for just a moment. So you'll lose audio for just a moment here. I'll switch over to this and then I'll be right back with you. Okay. Are we coming through okay? All right, we're coming now through the port caster. Um, still using my Earthworks SR314 this time. I just switched it over. So now we're coming through the port caster. And Danny, are you there as well? I am here. Okay. <laughs> so we have Danny on channel two, I'm on channel one. Um, let me just kind of talk about the philosophy that they appear to use here on the port caster and, and actually basically with all of the Sentrants. Um, recording and preamp and USB interface products that I've come across so far. So this is kind of, it's more of a kind of an analog approach to things, but they also of course have updated it. So you can use it as an audio interface. In this case, what we're doing is um, we're actually just using it as a preamp. So my mic's coming in here, Danny's here, and then we have a 3.5 millimeter line output here, and that's going into the ATEM Mini. So that's what you're hearing right now. Um, what's interesting, if we could switch to the Mac really quickly, I just wanna show on the Mac, here's the ATEM software control, and we're coming into mic input number one. One thing you will notice is that while the portcaster is able to put out a line level signal, it's actually, con uh, I guess what I would say, consumer line level. Um, and so we had to boost the level here. Actually, I got pretty close to clipping there. Um, do I have the limiter on? I do, but that may be this whole thing here. So it, what it appears, it appears to me that the output is probably, if I had to guess, it's probably consumer line level. So minus 10 dBV as opposed to plus four dBU. Um, not, a, not necessarily a problem, but just something to keep in mind. And in this case here, we're adding an additional 6 dB of gain here at the ATEM. Okay, we'll switch on back. Um, some things about this that are interesting. First of all, it does have limiters on each of the inputs, and they are analog limiters. And so you can see here as I talk, as that uh, lights up, that LED lights up as blue, that means the limiter is engaging. And I don't know all the parameters that it's using. It's, it's hard-coded. You can't change any of the settings. So it's, if I had to guess, it's probably kicking in somewhere around minus 8 dB. Or the equivalent of minus 8 dB full scale, I should say. Um, but in any case, you do have limiters on each channel and they are switchable for each channel. One of the things you'll notice here, they use these recessed switches, which are kind of a, I like them, but they're kind of a mixed blessing as well. You have to have a tool of some sort to switch them. So here, for example, um, it comes with a little tool, but I, I'm pretty sure I'll lose that, but you could just use a ballpoint pen. I'm gonna turn the limiter off on my channel. And Danny, does that sound any different to you when I turn the limiter off? just slightly, uh, just a little bit. Okay, how so? Not sure? I am not sure. Oh, not sure, okay. <laughs> but it just sounds a little different, yes. Okay, fair enough. So um, that's how, that's, just so you're aware, that is one thing that they do. I think they, they the idea here, the, the benefit of these kinds of switches is you're not accidentally going to bump them. The downside, of course, is that you do have to have some tool. A ballpoint pen does a, a nice job. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn that limiter that's now back on. Um, we do have high pass filters on. Uh, this does not appear to be switchable for different inputs, so it just turns on altogether. Let me go ahead and turn that on and let's see how that sounds. All right, now the high pass filter is turned on. I can definitely hear a difference there. Does it thin things out a little bit? Yes. Okay, so it may be somewhat aggressive there. 
Um, but maybe that's useful if you are very close miking and you're doing some proximity effect. Um, but that is the high pass filter there. Okay, turn that back off. All right, we have the gain pots. Um, so also, I guess should, I should say in terms of build quality, this is all aluminum here. Um, just the, the faceplate, they just put some some sort of plastic over the aluminum is what it feels like, aluminum. Uh, the gain knobs, are uh, all the knobs actually are rubberized. They have a kind of a nice feel, nicely damped. So that's all good there. Um, here we have a mono stereo uh, control and it's it's variable. So you can hear right now, I'm probably coming out of both speakers, but if I change this, let's see if that, no, it's still sending me out of both. Go ahead and talk for a second, Danny. Hi, it's uh, pretty hot here. Somebody asked what the Utah weather is like. We're getting some of that smoke from the, all the wildfires that are in the West, which I'm sure many people in the U.S. have gotten over the last week or so. Okay, so I would expect I would have expected that to to move if I went to stereo that I would appear I would hear I would come out the left channel and you would be on the right channel, but it doesn't appear to be doing that. Um, so, and that might be, that could potentially be a an ATEM thing, but no, I don't think so, because those, those are stereo channels on the ATEM. So, really not sure on that. That probably, maybe that only affects the USB mix, not sure. Um, we do have an input here uh, where you can uh, adjust between what you're, I thought it would just be what you're monitoring, input versus USB, or a mix of both, again, variable. But watch what happens when I switch over to USB as I keep talking, you'll notice. So as I switch back, you probably lost my voice entirely. In fact, I know you did based on the meters. So that affects not only the monitor mix, what you hear in your headphones, but also what comes out the output as well, which is kind of interesting. And then we have essentially the gain for this additional stereo input up on the top, which is where you can connect a phone. And in addition to being able to connect a phone for the podcasters out there, it also does a mix minus. So they will not get their audio echoed back to them, which is a nice feature. All right. Now, all of the other controls are on the bottom here. So I'm going to go ahead and hold this up and we're going to refocus that if you give me a second. Okay. We have, you'll notice we have actually two USB ports. This is the one right here. I'm powering with a USB battery bank. That's what this one is. There is a separate one for communication when you want to set this up as an audio interface with your computer or your mobile device. And I think part of the reason they did that, some people will say, well, that's kind of a pain. Why, why not just have a single USB port? And the advantage of that is that most mobile devices could not power this via USB. And so having a separate port gives you a little bit more freedom and uh, makes it so you can use it with more mobile devices. So for example, there are some USB microphones that you can probably use with an iPad Pro because the iPad Pro can deliver enough power, but it doesn't work with the smaller iPads or the mobile phones. And this gets around that issue altogether. So you can record directly to your phone and uh, potentially power via this other USB input, or there is an internal battery as well. I was able to get, um, let me just look it up really quickly to make sure I've got it right. No need to switch to this, Danny. I'm just going to look up a number. I was able to get five hours and 15 minutes of power time with the internal battery on this when I had when I was phantom powering the mics. So pretty good battery life. Um, Sentrance also does a battery replacement if you if you do have a problem with the battery. That of course they use a very high quality polymer lithium polymer battery. But if it does fail, um, they're a small shop and I think they're there for their customers. Is the sense I get so. Um, let's see, here's the phantom power switch down here. There's another, um, oh, here's the mono stereo switch. Let me switch that and let's see what happens here. This is separate from the knob up top. Okay, now I'm on the left channel. Danny, go ahead and talk. Hi, testing, one, two, three, yeah, and I'm somewhere else. You're on the right channel. <laughs> okay, so you can keep the channel separate if you need to do that. Uh, let's see if I can do this without. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and mute for just a second because I need to pull the line output out and to move this switch back. So that's another interesting thing about this. One second.
Okay, we are back. Um, so that's kind of a tight fit there. Um, let's see, let me get this back in the frame here. We do have a line input as well, you could see. So you could feed audio from a phone in here uh, as well, for maybe or maybe a music player if you wanted to add music to your podcast. We have a single headphone jack here. That is kind of a downside from my point of view. If you have a two-channel podcasting recorder, mixer, it would have been nice to have another headphone jack, to be honest. So if you do need to have headphones for each of the participants that are local, you will have to use an external headphone amplifier um, or a splitter or something like that. Uh, let's see here. Here's where you choose. It's hard for you to see there. Let me just get that. There it is. This is where you choose the output level. So you can output a, a basically a mic level or a line level signal. Right now you can see it's set to high, which is line level. Low would be a microphone level if you were going to feed the audio out to a mirrorless camera, for example. So that's what we've got there. Um, nothing special. Oh, on the back there is a quarter 20 tap, so you can attach it to a stand or anything like that if you needed to. Let me refocus here. Somebody asked, re the stereo, does the top knob alter the stereo mono width? Uh, we can test that. I'm going to go ahead and switch back. This might take a second. Okay, so now I'm on the left channel. And I'm on the right. Okay, let's go ahead and adjust this. So I'm still on the left channel. And I'm still on the right. Uh, still on the right. Yeah, I don't know if it's really doing anything for that either. And I'm on the right. <laughs> and I'm on the left. Doesn't appear to. I'll have to look into that a little bit more. Uh, switching back. Okay, we should be back to mono now, or dual mono, depending on how you want to look at that. Okay, any other questions about the Sentrance mixer, uh, sorry, portcaster? Evidently, the preamps supply up to 65 dB of gain. Um, I have not tried my Shure SM7B with it yet, but Danny is using a Shure KSM8. KSM8 doesn't need quite as much gain as the SM7B, but you can see she's at about 3 o'clock on the dial here. We do have enough room. We could go a little bit farther, uh, provide a little bit more gain. So I think you're going to kind of be on the edge with a Shure SM7B if you're live streaming. Um, but if you are recording a, a podcast, I think you'd probably be fine. And the preamps seem pretty good to me. How about to you? Seems good to me also. Yeah, okay. All right, any questions in the chat? I think we've covered them we've all. We've covered them all, okay. So far. Well, I'm going to go ahead and switch back. If you'll give me just a moment, I'm going to switch my microphone from the Portcaster back to the Shelford channel. One moment. Okay, now when I come back, you're going to hear some buzzing. Hear that? That is the Shelford channel. What happens with the Shelford channel, which is interesting, is that uh, when you turn it on, it actually takes a while to kind of settle in. So that's normal for the, I don't know if it's the transformers, but that buzz will be there for a little bit. Oh, the, yes, yeah, somebody asked what the price of the Portcaster is. I bought it when it was a Indiegogo campaign, um, but the price, <laughs> so it was a lot less expensive than I think it was 300 or maybe 350 um, US dollars, and I think it's now selling for 499 US dollars. That is one thing, I think that's a little bit on the high price end of the range. Um, I like it. Um, oh, I didn't also cover it. It is a recorder, it records to micro SD cards, um, 8 kilohertz, 24 bit. Um, I don't know, that price seems just a touch high to me. But um, the price that I got it for, I think was 300 or 350. At that, at that price, it's a really good device. At 499, it's still a good device, but you know, at that price, I would almost maybe save up and spend a little bit more for a mix pre, probably, would be my take. All right, <laughs> um, is the buzz still there? Nope. nope, settled in. So that's that's a feature of a lot of kind of 
Um, a lot of gear that's a little bit more kind of vintage gear tends to do that. A lot of analog gear, kind of higher end analog gear, does take a moment for it to settle in, just so you're aware. All right, let's go over to the uh, Rode Thread Adapter. Let me just show you this here real quick. Um, let me pull this portcaster out of our way here. And get all the cables out of the way. Okay, I think we're clear. <laughs> All right, so this is the Rode Thread Adapter, a new little product from Rode. Um, I don't know how much it runs. They just sent it to me, and they said, take a picture of it. We're going to do better than a picture. We're going to actually talk about it a little bit here. So you can see there are these various sections you can take apart. And so this one right here is a 5 8 inch, so that's a standard U.S. microphone stand, to quarter inch. You could also adapt that um, with this piece to make it a 5 8 inch. So that's 5 8 inch to 3 8 inch. So this is the standard thread size for most boom poles. So that's interesting. And then if you wanted to, in Europe, most of the microphone stands are actually 3 8 actually most of the places except for the United States. <laughs> microphone stands typically have a 3 8 inch thread. Um, so you can adapt this here to 3 8 inch on the receiving end and quarter inch on the um, attaching end. So it's kind of a clever little device that allows you to just adapt a lot of different things to a lot of different things. So kind of cool that Rode put that together. Of course, it's got the carabiner style hook on it there, so you can attach it to your sound bag or wherever else you wanted to attach it. And it feels like it's made out of some pretty solid, I don't know what, exactly what kind of metal that is, but um, feels pretty solid. So that is the Rode Thread Adapter. That's kind of a cool little thing to have on hand. Um, I can definitely see that coming in handy for different jobs, depending on what you're doing. So that's the thread adapter. Any questions on that one? I, I didn't even check to see the price. <laughs> if I had to guess, it's probably 20 bucks or something like that. All right. All right, cool. Let's go ahead and let's switch on over to our questions that were submitted ahead of time and see what we've got going there today. So first up is from Hal. Hal asks, can you chat on the best way to run a boom mic when traveling? Looking for what to buy that I can bring on a plane uh, light Nazi stand would not be a plus material, but enough to get the job done. So Hal, this is a tough one. I assume what you mean by this is you don't just need a boom pole. You need a boom stand, which is a different game altogether. So um, let me just, let's see here. Let me pull up a little something here. I did see, well, see, I, and it sounds like you're trying to do this on a budget too. So, huh. Um, I would get a microphone stand. Um, or, and actually, if you're traveling, you can probably source a, mic a standard microphone stand um, where you're going. So making arrangements and so you wouldn't have to take that part on the plane at all. Um, and then you can just attach things to it. So that's, that's one thought. It's sort of an out-of-the-box thought, I guess, on that. Um, the problem is, is if you're not going to take a C-stand, the problem is if you bring a boom pole and you try to, a, a traditional boom pole, I should say, and try to attach that to anything smaller than a C-stand, I would be concerned about the ability of the stand to hold it and not tip over. So that's what I would be very careful of there. The thing about microphone stands is they can be sourced almost anywhere. So that would be one of those things, like, like for example, when um, if traveling, and I don't do a lot of travel to, to go shoot, um, I've done a few jobs in the past, but... In those cases, sometimes what makes sense is to rent the C-stands when you get there as opposed to trying to haul those around with you, especially if you're flying. So that's just a, a one strategy to consider. There is, if I, I'm going to pull up True Audio here. When we went to True Audio, we actually saw DPA has a, um, a little boom microphone on a really light arm. And it's, I don't remember what it's called. I'm going to just do a search here for DPA boom. Let's go ahead and switch over to the Mac here. Um, I love True Audio. Here it goes. I was going to say, I love True Audio, but their search is really slow. <laughs> I think they're redoing the website right now. Um, ma, 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 ma. Here's the Micro Shotgun. Um, so this is the thing I was thinking of, but then it has, they also sell a boom with it as well. 
Let me see if they have that listed here as well. But this is not cheap, as you can see. So again, I don't know what your budget is or what you're aiming for. Um, so th there's some thoughts. If anyone has other thoughts in the chat, definitely let us know. Clever ideas on how to travel with a boom stand, not just a boom pole. Um, let's help out Hal and see if we can make things a little easier for him there. All right. Next question is from Kai. He has a short question. What would you recommend in terms of driving a decent set of studio monitors from a Mac? Not quite focal stu solos. Those are the uh, near field monitors that I have and they're for whatever reason, the iPad just disconnected. Um, okay. Um, he, so he's, so first of all, Kai, let me, well, I didn't put the whole question here because it was really, really long, but here's the short version of it. Um, Kai, I think you were asking about whether the Focal Alpha series versus the Shape series would be worth considering. I would definitely, I'd have no hesitations about the Shape series. Alphas were pretty decent too. Um, I'm not sure how much longer they're going to carry those. It seems like those have been around for a long time and they've discontinued some of their other lines. I'd probably look at the shape, and I re was really, really happy with the shapes um, from Focal as far as near-field monitors are concerned. So definitely something to look at there. And then, yes, you will need a DAC or some other way to get the audio um, out. And so typically what I use is an audio interface. So I am not... Um, I don't do anything fancy beyond that. So I, I, you know, I don't have a separate DAC. I just, in my case, I'm using my Apollo for work. I have an Apollo Solo, which is sort of the desktop version. And, um, but there, there are plenty of others as well. Even like the Focusrite Scarlets even have decent outputs on those. So you could definitely drive your focal monitors with those. Um, I, I'm quite fond of the Motu M2. We have one of those and been really happy with that. That one's in fact, I would probably opt for that over the Scarlet, personally. Um, if you want to get into the kind of the mid-range, there are... What are some mid-range audio interfaces? Motu has, you know, Motu has a variety of different options up there, their lineup. Focusrite has some other options as well. Out, outside of the Scarlet line, you're starting to get more expensive there. Obviously, Apollo is a universal audio. Apollo is going to be a lot more expensive. Um, although, I guess the Foco, the... Apollo Solo is about a $700, I think it's a $700 audio interface. Been super happy with that. Incidentally, I did get my new setup for um, work today, or not today, but this last week it all arrived. So I now have the Apollo Solo as the audio interface, and we have some JBL Series 3 monitors for monitoring, and those have been really nice as well. Not quite, a, there's definitely a difference between the Focals <laughs> and the JBLs, but the JBLs are doing surprisingly well for their price. So pretty happy with those. Um, one thing to consider in that Kai says here, um, he wants something to last, but also ultimately be ready for some of the new M Macs. I, th I assume what you, would, what you mean by that is the Intel Silicon Macs. And I will say this, so I have, for work, I do have an Intel Silicon MacBook Pro, and to get the drivers installed for the Focus, or sorry, not the Focus, right, the Apollo Solo, um, you do have, there was a bit of a workaround. They the, the current drivers that they have are not yet supported. They're running, they're running just fine, and they give you instructions on how to do it, but they just won't provide you any support if anything doesn't work until they f officially release them. So that's the typical way that Universal Audio approaches that and they're still working on the final version but i can say this in the case of the apollo solo they're working great i haven't had any issues with it whatsoever so there's some thoughts again out in the chat if you guys have other ideas of recommendations for kai for audio interfaces or ways to drive his new monitors definitely let him know all right next up from andrew we have a question about zoom calls i'm currently using the mix pre 3.2 with an sm7b into a gh5 via the 3.5 millimeter aux out and the 3.5 millimeter mic in to the camera. The camera is running into my MacBook with an HDMI capture card. I'm listening to my Zoom calls with headphones plugged into the MacBook. However, I'm wondering if there's a way that I can also monitor my own audio simultaneously. If I connect the MixPre to my MacBook via USB-C also, can I modern monitor my own audio in real time from the MixPre 3 headphone jack as well as the audio that is sent back to me from Zoom? And the answer, I believe, is yes. Let me grab my mix pre and let me show you there, there's some nuance here. Okay, we're gonna get that powered up. 
and let's come on over to our overhead cam here. So here we have a Mix Pre 3. You will need to go, oh, I just bumped the camera, sorry about that. Got kind of a tight fit here. Um, you will want to make a headphone preset to be able to do that. So the way you're going to do that is you're going to, um, let's just come in here. I am going to go into preset two. Actually, no, that, that's not to set it. I need to go to the edit, edit headphone preset. And I want to edit preset two. So here's where you have to set up your, pre, your uh, monitoring, your routing. So here, for example, on my left ear, I'm going to want to hear USB one and uh, whatever input you're plugged into. So in this case, I'm going to have input one and USB one in my left ear. And then over here on the right, I'm going to want USB two and input one on the right ear. So that's how you can set that up so that you'll hear both your own voice coming through directly through the preamp and the audio coming back from Zoom um, via USB. So that's how you should be able to set that up, Andrew. If you run into any problems, definitely let me know and we can work through any other nuances that come up. But that is how you would approach that. All right, let me get a sip of water because I'm getting a little funny voiced. In fact, I'm going to mute on the A10 Mini software so you don't have to hear this. All right. Let's come over to our next question here. Next up from Bill. Curious about your thoughts on the use of mics in addition to using the usual lav and boom on an actor. I have a number of table dialogue scenes to shoot and have the opportunity to hide a mic in the props on the table right in front of the actors. Phasing between mics comes to mind as a start. We'll be using a Mix Pre 10 2, Cost 11D, Sennheiser MKH 60. Not sure what is appropriate, if at all, to hide. I have all those extra channels and mics, thinking, why not some extra insurance coverage? And yeah, definitely, Bill. So plant mics are definitely something that are worth looking at. And um, I've seen you can plant anything. You can plant a directional mic if you have enough space to conceal it, um, which I think is ideal if you can, because that way you can um, basically you can use a directional pattern of the microphone to capture what you want to capture and not capture what you don't want to capture. Again, depends on the, the whole setup. Um, putting an omnidirectional microphone in there is, is I, I think, is actually, in some cases, can be preferable to actually body-worn lavalier microphones. So putting a, a lavalier microphone in a plant, if it's close enough, um, can get you some great sound. And if you've got extra mics sitting around, why not? Absolutely do it. So just give yourself more choices and give your post-production team more choices in post. Absolutely. That's my thought. <laughs> um, all right. Next up from Jared, I switched from a MixPre 6, the original, to an F8N. I wanted to keep my anchor battery option open, so I tried finding a Hiroshi to USB solution. I came across this cable and it worked well the first day I used it. Is there something I should be wary of, or is this a good solution to use USB batteries? So I'm not going to pull that up on the screen because it's on Amazon, and evidently Amazon um, has problems with people putting those kind of things on their screen. Bandru had a podcast piece on it, which I was very interested in. So anyway, um, I put a link for this particular cable, adapter cable down below. So basically what it does, is it allows you to run a USB battery bank um, out one side and then into the Hiroshi input, the power input on the Zoom F8N. And I don't see any issues with it. So basically that adapter cable is adapting the 5 volt, 2 to 3 amp output of the battery bank into a 12 volt, um, I think 1.5 amp output on the Hiroshi side. So um, power conversion wise, it should be fine. The only thing that I could see potentially causing a, a problem is if the circuitry is really in, you know, really poorly done and fails at some point, but that's going to be an issue with anything potentially. Um, that was a pretty cheap cable as I recall. So some that's, that's the only thing I would be wary of really. But if it's, if it's, as long as it's working, it should be fine. As long as it's actually delivering the 12 volt 1.5 amps, it should be just fine. All right, let's go ahead and switch over to uh, our chat and see what we've got going in the chat today. See what everyone wants to talk about. Danny's going to scour through. Ted, what advantage do you see in having the hardware shelf or channel strip instead of going through your Apollo Twin Duo, or is it a preamp used along with the Apollo? Um, the advantage I see 
is that it's a it's a it's a singularly analog channel, uh, you know, signal chain up until it gets to the camera, and then the camera converts it to digital and takes it into the ATEM from there. It's just simplicity. Um, you could certainly run it through an Apollo or any other sort of audio interface and have that do the conversion. The part of the reason I stay away from that is that the Apollo in particular, if you start applying, I don't know the details on this, but if you start applying some of the plugins, the digital signal processing on the Apollo, I think the latency changes. It's pretty fast, but I think the latency changes. And so applying a, an audio offset in, say, for example, the ATEM software control to accommodate the fact that the audio is arriving sooner than the camera signal, um, that's going to be a little bit more variable, potentially. So that was a, that's one thing that I would kind of shy away from. Or if you're if you are going to use the Apollo, maybe consider not doing any processing, which is a little bit of a downside because that's one of the big reasons you buy an Apollo because <laughs> the processing is so good um, and emulates all of these wonderful analog um, out, outboard pieces of gear. So that's that's kind of one thing. I haven't tested that extensively, so I don't know, but that's a, just something that comes to my mind and basically why I stick with the Shelford channel because it's just a simple... I, I, always, I do believe in keeping the signal chain as simple as possible. So that's kind of how I approach it. Good question, Ted. All right, next up from Shoji. How do you balance good sound quality of an individual speaking voice versus their speech intelligibility? These two goals are sometimes at odds with, with each other. Um, I think intelligibility is trumps the um, sounding good, but I, but almost always I find that sounding good is, um, I mean, if, if you can get things to sound good, usually I would consider them intelligible as well. So I kind of wrap them up into one thing in some ways. I see what you're saying, but I usually consider those kind of the, if I can get something sounding good, um, that means to me, at least it's also very intelligible. And that's part of the, the, it's part of what I'm really talking about when we cover the whole concept of loudness. Loudness is not just kind of competing with all of the surrounding videos and other content out there, podcasts. It also has to do with intelligibility. It's very much about making it easy for the audience to understand what's being said because um, audio in, in term for spoken word content, whether that's a podcast or a video or whatever, the audio is absolutely critical and, and being able to understand what the people are saying is super important. I, I've actually watched, you know, sometimes when I'm exercising, I'll stream a, a TV show and I'm, and I have to, every once in a while I have to rewind. Cause I'm like, I didn't understand what they just said, which is really frustrating. It's like, what? Like that should be the number one goal <laughs> is intelligibility. The audience shouldn't be guessing as to what was said. You can obviously do very subtle things, um, but they still need to be understood to immediately by the audience from a from an aural point of view. Now, if you're going to do, you know, interesting, artsy kind of things as far as, um, you know, for shadowing and all these other kind of subtle things, that's great. But the 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 what somebody says on camera should never be subtle. It should be. I mean, it can be subtle, but it always needs to be understandable. Is what I mean to say. So. It's an interesting conversation, Shoji. Thanks for bringing that up. Though, so I, I, I would say that intelligibility is number one, definitely. Okay, Ken. Three comments. Ken has three things to say here. I. No, three different comments. Oh, Ken has three different things. I recommend the Matthews Reverse Stand, seven foot for traveling, fits in a suitcase, works great for most interviews. Excellent, Ken. Thanks for sharing that. Matthews Reverse Stand, seven foot. I'm going to look that up while we're here, because I'm curious about that, too. Let's see. Matthews reverse stand seven foot. Oops, not seven inch, seven foot. Okay, so it's it's sort of like a... Um, let's go ahead and switch to the Mac here. It looks sort of like a light stand. I can't tell what the stud on the top is. Um, but it looks like a light stand, so you'd need some sort of adapter there. Um, a lot of those have quarter-inch studs on the top, so incidentally, using this re road thread adapter could actually uh, help you out in that situation. But yeah, that looks like it's light enough weight. I don't know. Um, you'd have to get a boom to go with that, too. So that would be another piece. Okay, cool. Let's see what else uh, Ken has to say here. 
skip the boom pole and use a mic stand and put sandbag and weight on the legs. Yeah, I agree with that too. That's a def that's a possibility. Again, if it depends on if it's going to be a standing uh, piece or if the person's going to be. Yeah, I just I guess we don't have enough information. Hal, um, if it's a walk and talk, that's different. You need a you know obviously you need a, a hand boom pole. If it's a sit or a stand, you need to know how tall the person is and how much you know clearance you're going to need. So that's going to kind of define what kind of microphone stand you can use. A lot of the like the stage stands will only go up to about, I don't know, six feet or so. So that's not going to be enough for standing in a lot of situations. So another piece of information there. But thanks for that, Joe. That's a good point. Zach, I attach my boom pole to a light stand with grip and pole holder. Light stand legs adjust wide enough to be able to stand without even a sandbag. I'd be super careful about that, Zach. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess if you get the right the right stand there. So there's some more input for you, Hal. Thanks for that, Zach. Camille, thank you for the super chat. Um, the Chef's CMC641 is often seen as a gold standard. You prefer the MKH8050. What do you think the Chef's falls short of? Um, I don't think it falls short of. I think what I would care I would characterize the Sheps as being brutally honest, and the reason that yeah, it's just brutally honest. So a lot of times, what comes what what you capture on the recorder is going to need some post treatment. So if you need a quick turnaround or you have no time for a turnaround, that's where the Sheps would not be my first choice. Um, that's where I find the Sennheiser would be a in, in my experience, a better choice if I've got to turn quickly or if I'm doing something live, like a live stream, I would probably prefer the, the Sennheiser for that. I have both of them, um, love both of them, but I definitely, I find in most cases with people's voices, I have to do post with the Sheps. So that's that's the main reason I say that. Hope that makes sense. I think a lot of people uh, go with the philosophy and you, you saw it become, you know, one person that was a big advocate for the Sheps microphones was... Um, Jeff Wexler, um, he discovered them, I think, quite some time ago, and he he was a big advocate for them. And his philosophy was, I want to deliver the truth, and then Post can do whatever they need to do with it. So in those circumstances, yeah, that totally makes sense. If Post is going to be working on it and they want to, you know, approach it with the most truthful representation of reality, then, then yeah, that's a fine approach. Um, but if you need to turn a little bit more quickly, that's where it gets messy. Okay, question from Phil. I'm having a problem with not being heard on set with my film crew. Generally, I'm ignored or told to get out of the way. Any advice on how to assert myself? I assume, Phil, you're doing sound. Um, so that's always going to be a challenge. I think a big part of it is not so much what happens on set, but the relationship you establish with the director up front um, and the other you know people on set that you're going to be inter interfacing with. So it's definitely having a good relationship with them. It's also speaking up when it's appropriate to speak up and, and advising the director when you need to. So for example, if you're finding that something is being blocked in a way or um, the gaffers are setting things up in a way that are gonna, is gonna be potentially problematic for sound, the director should want to know about that. They should, know, they should want to know that and have you tell them that there is potential for an issue with sound if we continue to approach it this way or you need to make a suggestion for how to salute, how to solve that problem, you know, some sort of solution. So I think that what the director, a big part of establishing a good relationship with the director is advising them. Just like, you know, if there's a president, they have a cabinet and they want their advisors to tell them, to give them all of the information so that they can, you know, achieve the goal, in this case, making a film or a video. And so you need to fill that role. So that's that's my biggest piece of advice is, establish that relationship up front talk with the director before you even get to set to make sure that you understand what's required um, you know get some clarification by saying typically this is how i work i will definitely provide i will provide input if i'm starting to see maybe you know something about the setup on on set that is going to potentially pr provide or impose problems for sound i will let you know are you okay with that um, these are the types of discussions you should definitely have with the director ahead of time. And, it, you know, if you establish that good relationship, what I found in 99% of cases is that the director will advocate for you. So if you do speak up, the director will say, okay, everyone else quiet. I need to talk to Phil here for just a second. Phil, what is it you wanted to say? So that's what, that's my advice on how to do that on set. 
Love to hear other people's advice too in the chat. Hi, Sonoga. He has a question. Is a setup comprising an audio recorder and audio mixer, which item comes first? Assuming the mixer doesn't have audio recording capabilities. Yeah, then definitely the mixer comes first. Um, well, depending on what you're doing. I mean, I'm assuming it, it really depends on what you're doing. So there have been situations where I have recorded a live show. And by a live show, I mean a musical performance. And the recorder came after the mixer. Um, and then I, of course, what I found typically in those cases, I also have to mix in some additional room mics. So I'll usually have those connected to the recorder. Um, because a lot of times the house mix is really optimized for the venue itself. That is to say, they've done a bunch of EQ to help prevent feedback. And so while it will, it will sound good coming out of the loudspeakers in that space, if they send that same mix out of the outputs that come to your recorder, it may not sound, it'll, it may sound a little bit weird. Um, so I usually like to put some room mics up as well. Um, can I think of any circumstances where... Um, if you're if you're doing a submix, maybe you might run audio directly to the recorder first and then out of there into a mixer. If it's a weird live show, I don't know. That's that's a kind of an unusual one. Mike talked about when Mike Strengths came on the show a couple of years ago now, um, one of the things he talked about was taking a tap of each of the microphone feeds coming into the mixer. So he actually got a feed directly of the mic before it went into the mixer. So in that case, they were basically parallel, both the recorder and the mixer. Um, of course, you have to put some isolation between there in most cases, so a transformer of some sort. Um, but almost always, the it's either parallel with the mixer or for live shows, or it's after the mixer. It's been my experience. I hope that answers your question. I don't know the entire context, but hopefully that's useful. All right, Hampton Stromler. Have you ever used the Mackie HR624 Mark II studio monitors? If so, what are your thoughts about them? I have you, my brother actually mixed with Mackies for a while. Let me just see if those are the, if that's the particular model. A Mackie HR624. I don't think it's those, though. I think it was a different set of monitors. No, Adorama doesn't have them. What about B and H? Doing a search here, Mackie HR624. So probably six inch woofer is my guess. Let's take a look. No, I have not used those. Um, I think my brother was working with the... Whichever one my brother was working with were the one was the one that had a passive radiator on the bottom, I believe. I don't know if these do that as well. And this is a class AB amp, 250 watt. This one's just bigger. Um, now, I haven't worked with those, so I, I don't know. Mackie has done a good job traditionally with those. Um, I'm not familiar with this newer line here, so if anyone else has experience with them, we'd love to hear about it in the chat. Thanks for that. Sorry, Hampton, didn't have more info on that one for you. Okay, now this one actually is three from one person. Okay, three, three strung together here. D-Studio Sky News. Hi, I'm French and I speak a poor English, but I do my best and have a question. I'm impressed when I listen uh, sound take for a movie because I hear sounds seem like to uh, capturing in front of mouth, okay? And I know it's taken from a boom pole, not near the mouth of the actor. Then my question is, my feeling is the chain of quality of all the devices to record is responsible to have this proximity, even if the sound is capturing from the boom pole at a few inch uh, to the actor. Yes, I, I agree. I mean, there's a lot that goes into creating cinematic dialogue. Um, a, there is plenty of post-processing too, don't get me wrong. But yes, of course, you have to start with a very high quality recording. So it's not just booms. Um, a lot of lavalier microphones, a lot of, as they call them now on the, in the set, on the set, wires, which is ironic because they're actually wireless microphones or it's wireless audio. Um, anyway, but there's a lot of lavalier microphones used as well. In some respects, the advantage of a lavalier microphone is that it's very close, usually often mounted on the chest here. And so you're going to get a little bit more of that chest resonance, um, which makes them sound, uh, gives you more bass. Um, you have to be careful with that in light of the conversation we had earlier at, uh, relating to Shoji's question, um, because intelligibility becomes important if you get too much of a boom 
uh, too much of that bass and that gravelly sound, which they they tend to like to really put on men's voices in particular. Um, you have to be careful about that. But it's not just a boom mic. It is oftentimes a lav mic as well, or they're cutting back and forth between them. Um, but then there's a lot of post-processing that happens as well, is my impression, especially, I mean, I just think of the the scene in uh, Star Wars Episode Seven, um, where Han Solo and Chewbacca first come back onto the Millennium Falcon, and um, Han Solo says, we're home, Chewie, or something like that, whatever it was he says. But they did some massive, massive amount of processing on that, it sounds like. Um, to really kind of give it this, um, I don't know, a lot of gravity, I guess. It was really kind of an emotional moment in some ways that they wanted to use to bring people back into the Star Wars story. And so they added all of this really, it was a really rich sound to it. So I don't know which mic they used in that particular case. My guess is that was a boom mic. And then they did a plenty of post-processing to really make it sound rich and impactful. So yes, I agree. There There are lots of things, but yes, high quality through the entire signal chain, both in terms of capture and in terms of post-production. There's also a comment on this question. Oh, okay. How to record a sound from a boom pole positioning a few inches from the actor, and I have a sound with a nice proximity effect like put in front of the mouth. I'm wondering if it's possible. Well, it depends on the microphone. Some of them do more of that than others. The one that comes to mind immediately is the Rode NTG3, if you really do want a lot of that proximity effect. That microphone seems to have it in spades. The uh, Sennheiser MKH 416 tends to have it as well. So you will need to get just up off the forehead, but you will pick up plenty of that, that low end if that's what you're really looking for. So those are two thoughts that you can do with that. Some mics are going to sound more natural. They're not going to pick up that. They're, they're intentionally designed not to do as much proximity effect. So just be aware of that. It's, that's part of the thing. Um, and then Mike says, it could be that the sound is coming from a hidden lavalier or is subject to ADR dialogue replacement. That's a great point as well. There is dialogue replacement. Um, in post-production, a lot of feature film dialogue has been through ADR. That's true. I think what we're finding, I think we are finding now with a, with a certainly in the past, ADR was a huge part of the production. And in fact, you know, it was easy, easily 75% of the audio that you heard in the final movie was dialogue replacement that was done in post. Um, so the actors come back in and reread their lines while watching the, you know, the, the the video or the film that was already edited. So there was a lot of that. But what we're finding now is that I think a lot of productions are trying to get to the point where there's less ADR. And there are films now where they're starting to brag about, you know, we only had to ADR maybe 10%. So even even with it, and these are not that new, but the um, I remember reading a piece on the dialogue mixer, or sorry, the uh, the production mixer for, um, and Danny's going to cringe over here, so be prepared for this, um, but the Lord of the Ring movies, um, the Peter Jackson movies, um, the, the production mixer said that in the final mix, 90% uh, of that was production audio, which is amazing, um, especially in light of some of the shots that they did with those with the big techno cranes and all sorts of crazy noisy stuff um, that just wreaks havoc on sound, especially on wireless. Um, but yeah, so definitely ADR is a part of it. Um, but that's a great point, Mike. So if they're getting a really rich sound, sometimes that's ADR as well, which is means they recorded after the film was shot, they had this, the actors come back in the studio and record. And in that case, they could easily be close mic'd and get that sound if that's what you're going for. All right, Techno Cheesecake, good to hear you. Here, good to have you here again. My friend has been having issues with hissing and dropouts with A10s. They are mathematically placed. Any ideas what is causing this? Mm, there's so many factors. Um, but I would are they using the whip antennas? And if so, you have to tune, you have to use the right whip antennas depending on the frequency that they're using. So the kit actually comes with, and I think you can actually buy um, separately the whip antennas that are optimized for different frequencies. So you need to be using those for the right frequencies. That's one thing. Another thing is using a shark fin or log periodic dipole array type antenna. That can help a lot as well. Um, I don't know what the hissing is. That's That sounds like a different thing. Hissing, usually with hissing on a digital system like that is more of an issue with the microphone or the cable or the connectors at the, you know, with the body pack. So that's what I'd look at for the hissing. The dropouts are um, 
that's going to be what you need to to look at the the wireless. So it's really important to get to understand a little bit of wireless or RF theory so that you understand which antenna to use at the right time. And most of the production mixers I see now, if you're not just working from a bag right next to the actors, a lot of them are using some sort of antenna, uh, after party or after third party antenna that is a log periodic dipole array, like, like a shark fin, um, or at least a dipole antenna, which again, they also need to be oriented correctly. So if you have the antenna on the body pack vertically and you have, or maybe horizontally, and you have the antenna on the receiver vertically, you're not going to get very good. You're going to, you're probably going to experience a lot more dropouts. So be aware of that as well. They need to be oriented correctly because they're mono, those are monopole antennas. So those are some thoughts, Techno Cheesecake. I hope that helps a little bit. Zach, what was that about Amazon not wanting their product pages displayed? Um, I, I don't know the whole story, but if you go to, there's a podcast by my friend Bandrew. He has the podcastage channel on YouTube, and he does a separate podcast called Bandrew Says. And he talked about how he showed an Amazon, I think that's what it was. He showed an Amazon page in one of his videos, and he got in trouble for that, basically. I don't know the whole story, and I don't understand why that would be an issue for them. But anyway, b doesn't seem to have a problem with it. <laughs> Um, Sheriff Logs, have you used any pre-Sonus fader port or other surface controllers when working with audio? Yes, I have the single channel fader port um, from years ago, and that was really helpful. It, the only downside with that particular one, the single channel one, was that it was one of the few that actually worked with Adobe Audition, actually, um, reliably at least. The problem is, is ideally, if I'm if I'm trying to mix a podcast, for example, I'd like at least two faders. That one only had one fader. Um, but yeah, the fader port was great. I really liked it. It worked pretty decently with uh, Adobe Audition. It, of course, will work with Studio One and other DAWs as well. But I was happy with it. Um, they also have, I think, a six-channel version. Um, I haven't used that one, but that one looked like it was a it was a newer product, and it seemed to be a good fit. I don't know if they ever got Adobe Audition updated to take advantage of all six faders, though. So that's something to consider as well. Mark. We use the Rode Reporter for ENG work and have been thinking about getting a Sennheiser MD46. Do you have any thoughts on a comparison? I've used both of those. Um, the MD46 is more is obviously directional, so that's really helpful for interviews in really noisy locations, but you have to get it oriented correctly. The principle that the Rode Reporter works with is um, it's just dynamic, and it's, um, it's omnidirectional, if I remember correctly. So that's just keeping the microphone between the two of you. So it's not going to reject as much, but it's also a lot more forgiving if you don't get it aimed exactly right. So there's a trade-off there. Um, Sound-wise, I like both of them. They both sound pretty good. The MD46 probably sounds a little bit better. Um, so if you if you can be very careful about aiming the microphone, the MD46 would probably be my choice. Um, but the road can get the job done too. So I've, done, I've, I've used both to good effect. All right. Uh, Vishal, if I'm, I hope I'm saying that right. Would you still buy the Tascam DR10L today? Also, what are your thoughts on the XLR adapter for the Rode VideoMic NTG? Problem solved. Um, DR10L seems like a fine, um, device today. Yes. I don't have any issues with it. It's, it's, um, I think a lot of people get more excited about the 32-bit float recorders these days. So the Zoom F2 and the, um, Tentacle Sync Track E. Those are the two that people get really excited about with 32-bit float. Um, the nice thing about having 32-bit float on a body pack recorder like that is since you can't really monitor it the entire time, under most circumstances, that the 32-bit float in that case becomes really pretty helpful because <laughs> you're not going to clip it, whereas on the Tascam DR10L, you could potentially clip it. Nevertheless, I think the DR10L is a fine choice. Um, of the three... The, probably the Zoom F2, the included lavalier microphone with the Zoom F2 probably sounded best, and that's not amazing, but it was better than the Track E's included microphone, and the Tascam's included microphone to me didn't sound that great either. Um, but those are some thoughts on comparing those three, but the Tascam DR10L is a, seems like a fine piece to me, fine piece of equipment. Um, wait, there was another question there real quick. If we go back to that. Wait. Um, thank you, Brian, for the super chat, by the way. So back to Vishal's question. Um, thoughts on the XLR adapter for the Rode VideoMic NTG? Problem solved. I, I assume what you're talking about there is the VXLR Pro, 
which actually makes the connection, uh, it uses a transformer to create a balanced connection on the output. Um, so yeah, that seems like a problem solved. I don't know if you're talking about that. I think that's what you're talking about, but yeah, I haven't used it yet, um, but yes, that seems to have solved that particular problem. If you do need to do a long cable run, um, that should have you pretty well covered. Okay. Tyler, any thoughts on the DPA 4097 gooseneck microphone? I'm thinking about using it as a plant mic in conjunction with Sony's UWPD plug-on transmitter. Um, I have not used it personally, but lots of people have. Um, DPA makes great microphones and the goosenecks get lots of use. They've always sounded good to me. So that's about all I can offer. Let me just look up the 4097 in particular. Yeah, that's the core micro shotgun. And in fact, um, going back, just to kind of continue the conversation, let's switch over to the Mac here real quick. Um, this is what I was thinking of originally, Hal, but that's not cheap. <laughs> but it's a really, this is what we saw at the at True Audio. Um, so it's basically a very light boom. Well, that's probably a weighted stand, a weighted base here, um, but it folds up and can be transported pretty nicely. But yes, this this particular one I have heard. I haven't used it firsthand, but I've heard lots of samples from it, uh, Tyler, and it sounds fantastic to to me. So I think it's a good choice. I don't know exactly what you're doing with it, but it seems like a good uh, plant mic. Yeah, probably I assume capturing dialogue. So yeah, it'd be a great choice. Lloyd, it's good to have you here, Lloyd. I uh, hope everything is going well. Film Devices has a travel boom and holder. It is meant to work with a C-stand, so you would need to rent one at the location. Great, thanks for that input as well. Let me just look that up really quick. I haven't heard of that. Film Devices. Um, travel boom. Yeah, let's go ahead and pull that up here. So we have... Oh, this is cool. This is actually and fairly affordable. Thanks for that, Lloyd. That's really helpful. So it has a grip head and a holder and then a, what looks like a fairly lightweight uh, boom pole. So yeah, thanks, Lloyd. Hope you're doing well. It's good to have you here. Good to see you. Well, virtually see you. <laughs> um, Phil, do you have any advice for carefully wording to talent to speak louder, fuller on set? Sometimes with the boom and lav, when they do quiet dialogue, it's just bad with noise floor. Well, if they're doing a lot of whispering, that's that's an opportunity to actually gain up some. So it depends on what you're doing. And I don't I assume in this case you're also directing. If that's the case, then get out your directing voice and your directing chops and start directing. Um, we were actually working on this at work right now. Um, we have one our our um, our main on-camera talent also directs the other talent, the other producers when they come on camera. And he is a fantastic director. He's really, really good at evoking or, you know, kind of pulling performance out of them. And so you have to just get way into it and way just communicate and demonstrate and do everything you have to do to get things working. So that, also, that of course, has to be balanced with you have to step back and let them do the performance as well. So... It's kind of a, you know, it's some of each, but directing is an absolute art. And so it's hard to encapsulate that into a quick, you know, piece of advice. But get, you are there to help them do their best. And so get in there and help them do their best, whatever that takes. And uh, if you're shy, get out of your shy. Just pour everything you have into it. So there's some advice. Shoji, a little off topic. Have you, oh, you know what? I didn't answer the last question. That was submitted ahead of time and we need to do that so shoji let me get your question then we're going to go back to the ipad and get that one in just a second um a little off topic have you run a live stream with an atem mini pro plus camera plus monitor from a remote location where ac power is not available if so what battery ac source was used uh battery dc to a well um keep in mind that this is a dc input on the atem mini so i don't know what the exact i don't know what the voltage and the specs are for the input but if you can get a a battery source that can supply that, then you should be able to power that. So I have not done it, Shoji, so I don't have any specific advice in terms of products to look at. Um, but that's what I would do. I would look at the specs on what it needs as an input and then go find a battery solution that can deliver that. So if anyone knows specifics on that, um, definitely please let Shoji know. All right, back to 
let me go back to the iPad. Oops, my mistake. Okay, uh, this is a non-sound related question, at least not directly sound related from Richard. Have you had a chance to test the new um, Canon C70 firmware? What are your thoughts? I had a chance to install it last night and I resisted the temptation knowing that we had this live stream today. So <laughs> the answer is no, I have not installed it yet. And I did that very intentionally so that we wouldn't botch up today's live stream. So what I want to do is I want to install the new firmware when I have several days. Oh, wait, what? Oh, I'm told it's time. Okay, so this is that's what you mean. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, I intend to do that when I have a number of days where I can get the problem, any problem solved if any problems come up, and so that I can test out the new functionality. So it looks like for me, the biggest thing is probably um, the new autofocus tracking has now been extended to fill the whole or most of the frame. I don't know if it was the whole frame, but much more of the frame. And so I'd want to test that a little bit more before I put it to use on the live stream because I have a tendency to botch things up on live streams and I want to avoid that as much as possible. So, all right. I think that's going to do it for us today. Thanks everybody for joining us on our live stream today. I hope you get a chance to get out there and make some great sound this week. And we'll talk to you again next time. Take care, everybody.